I'm Robbie Kelman Baxter, author of The Membership Economy and The Forever Transaction. And I'm here with a great session. Uh, we're going to be talking about bundles. Bundles are a hot topic right now, and Outside Plus is a fascinating example. A few months ago, Outside announced they were welcoming 20 new publications uh, to their family, including Trail Runner, Velo News, and Yoga Journal. More recently, they launched a suite of new features, such as training plans and workouts, access to Gaia GPS's premium app, and discounts for outdoor events available with a new Outside Plus membership. By bundling together content, discount, and other benefits, Outside is building a membership that more fully delivers on their promise to inspire active participation in the world outside. Tommy O'Hare is the Senior Vice President of Business Development and Licensing for Outside, and he joins us today to share the journey of rolling up these benefits to support the goals and challenges of Outside's most engaged members. Welcome, Tommy. Hey, thank you, Robbie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you today. Yeah, me too. Um, I've been looking forward to this. So, so let's start with with Outside and what its mission is. Sure. Yeah, um, we represent the active living and the healthy lifestyle categories. Um, those are huge categories across the globe now, um, and they've only accelerated with growth during COVID um, because they've been you know some of the few activities that people have been able to do um, to stay active, um, as well as people have been much more inclined to pay attention to their health during COVID. Um, we add value within this ecosystem um, by providing premium content and providing it to the right user at the right time um, on the right device. Um, it's an exciting journey. We've just begun the journey. Um, we've made a lot of progress, I think, in terms of personalization um, and making it easier for people to find the content. But um, we've got a long way to go and an exciting journey to take. Yeah, so so let's let's talk about the journey, um, especially the part that that you've been on. Um, so can you take me back? I think uh, to to late twenty nineteen, and share a little bit about about how you came to join the outside team. Yeah, sure. Um, I've known Robin Thurston, who is our CEO, for about six or seven years. Um, Robin is the previous co-founder of uh, Map My Fitness, which was sold to Under Armour, um, and then was also the CEO. Um, of a big tech startup in the DNA space out here in Silicon Valley called Helix. Um, he's had experience as a professional cyclist. Um, he worked in a media business working for Reuters and some other financial news businesses. Um, and he saw an opportunity um, related to content um, and the active living and the healthy lifestyle space. And I've always been involved in the digital media and the sports side of things. And um, we got to talking and he told me about what he had done with his investment in um, the, the previous iteration of our company called Pocket Outdoor Media, um, which owned four brands and more of the endurance space, Triathlete Magazine, Women's Running, um, Velo News, Podium Runner, and some experiential cycling events. Um, and he started talking to me about basically the gap that he saw in this space, in particular around content, and he thought that there could be a better job with it, um, making the publications more digitized, um, making the content better in terms of um, just the quality of it, as well as the volume of it. Um, and developing a digitally focused business and capturing synergies by using a common platform, um, common sales systems, and then ultimately building out a new digital subscription. And so um, that was very, very exciting to me, um, very inspired by Robin and very inspired by the opportunity here. And so that's how that's how I've ended up at Outside. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear about that, that vision and what Robin and you saw as, as kind of the gap between you know, digital and print, and also in terms of solving the full problem or, or helping the, the customer, the reader achieve, achieve their full goals, um, yep. using tools that that might not have been available when some of those publications were first started. Yeah, yeah, very much <laughs> true. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting right now. Um, you know, the first part of our journey has really been about, you know, like how do we build the business and how do we possibly serve every single vertical of the active living and the healthy lifestyle space. Um, a big part of our journey now is really around technology. And a lot of that is around personalization. And the ultimate goal is like, how do we make someone's life better with the content that we have? Um, and a lot of that is like one, just improving the content that we have again, the quality and the quantity of the content. But another piece of that journey is, you know, how do you basically get that content to the right user at the right time 
Um, a lot of that is, you know, really around just personalization and things that you do with software. A lot of it also is around having, you know, the various different types of technology that you need. So for us, we own a GPS mapping company called Gaia. So at some point, people need their, their content served to them directly, like as they're hiking. Other times, it's more passive. They've just finished a workout and we want to be able to present them with, you know, recovery information or food information, nutritional information that they don't like there. So um, it's exciting stuff for us. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, it, one of the things I think about a lot is the concept of, you know, you have this promise to your members, this forever promise, I'm going to help you achieve your goals, or I'm going to help you solve your problems, I'm going to help you understand the world around you, so you can make better decisions, or I'm going to help you um, get the most enjoyment out of your your hobbies and passions. And very often, that promise delivering on it starts with media starts with content. But there are other ways to deliver on that offering. And, and some of them, as you point out, are, are other products and services, but some of it is just how that content is delivered. And increasingly, mm -hmm. the, the how it's delivered is part of part of the product. Um, yeah, it, it's not it's not just tech support. Um, it's yeah. not just IT, it's actually yeah. core to the experience. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting right now the interplay between you know, probably a media person would think of product or, or product as the content, literally the editorial content, the text, the photos, the videos, and that type of thing. If you're talking to, you know, a, a technology focused company, it's about the software and the hardware and those different types of things that are out there right now. And so we really blend the two of them together. And, you know, for us, there's so much content that's pushed to people. It's difficult for them to basically, you know, find the information that they need to make their lives better or there's a lot of data that's pushed to them from the various fitness trackers or the other things out there that are tracking sort of biometrical data. And for us, we really want to combine those two types of things and make it so simple for the user that they don't have to go out and actively find the content and they don't have to figure out what they actually need you know, for content. We want to basically present them with content that surprises and delights them. And we do that by making their lives better. And so, you know, you can think of an example at some point where we might be pulling in the data from a fitness tracker or something like that and looking in the, looking at that data and realizing like how does a user run where what's happening in the running patterns could we prevent them um, could we show them some articles about injury prevention because we see they might be running too much or you know they've just <laughs> finished their work they've just finished their workout and here you should have this nutritional supplement right now or we see you haven't been working out recently and you know here's some here's some articles on me mental health and things to get you going again so that gets really exciting for us and gets us, you know, gets us out of bed and gets us fired up every single day to go to work. Yeah. It, what I, what I, what I like about that example is, you know, we're talking about bundles and I think some, some organizations think of bundles as just, let's just pile on some benefits, whatever mm -hmm. we happen to have available. But what I like about the way you're describing this is that the, the different elements of the bundle work together in concert. So you talk yeah. about, you know, the article to support what you're learning from the tracker. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really important um, for, for people to keep in mind as they're thinking about their own, their own bundles and, and what should go in the bundle and what, what shouldn't go in, through in, into the bundle. And, and I know that's something you've been thinking about a lot over the past 20 months or so. Um, yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about the, the acquisitions you've made, the decisions you've made over the last um, year or two, and, um, and, and how you thought about what should be part of, of this bundle, of this, 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 uh, this offering, this membership. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, like I said, you know, we know we want to change people's lives. Um, we know that we represent the active living and healthy lifestyle category. And we know like the next step behind that is like, how do you get this content, the right content to the right user at the right time. And so obviously we looked at our assets and, you know, didn't have, uh, you know, a ton of assets that were in the portfolio. And so as we started to build out the bundle, you know, we looked for various things to complete it, you know, at the various touch points of someone like, in the example of say, like a cyclist, you know, what is their what is their day like? And what are the things that they need? And so, you know, obviously content, you know, editorial content and video content is a big part of that. You know, those are things they're really probably going to be consuming most of the times off of the bike. Um, but then you look at, you know, the other things that a cyclist might need. And a lot of times that's training plans, um, you know, like they need sort of route mapping and things like that. You know, if they're going to go basically out in the backcountry, they need topographical maps and things like that. And that's where Gaia GPS comes in. Um, they're going to be participating in events. So we own a bike, um, we own, um, 
an event registration company that focuses on endurance events. So running events, biking events, that type of thing. We own a finish line photo company called Finisher Picks that uses artificial intelligence to read the data in the photos and match it up with the database of runners and cyclists and then matches it up with the photo that's in their system. There's discounts on that. We own a participatory event company called um, World Massif um, that has um, road biking um, events, gravel biking events, um, mountain biking events, and things like that. Um, we own a streaming service um, that also is available on linear television um, called Outside Television. And so, you know, we start to look at all those things and you say like, look, you want to touch every part of the cyclist or the runner or the, or the yoga um, person's life. And so, you know, we want those to be in the bundle. Um, so you want to basically make sure you have all the right sort of elements of content and utility for them. Part of that's the technology. And then you look at the economics, you know, like what can you actually make of this? And you want to be able to provide like a significant value for that user. And so we put all that content and those utilities together in a bundle. And right now um, that's called Outside Plus. It's $99 a year, but it's over $350 of value um, for the end user if they'd gone and bought these services on their own. So, you know, it's, you know, first of all, it's always about the user. And then secondarily, we know if we, if we make a great product for the user, um, and we work hard on the economics, we can provide a lot of um, financial value for that user too. Yeah. So, so can you talk, a lot of people on the, on, on the, um, a lot of the delegates are um, from the print world, the, the world of, of print media. Can you talk about, and, and you talked a lot about how your vision and Robin's vision was really around, you know, a lot of it was about digital. A lot of it was about expanding the relationship that was launched by these, these print publications. What do you think of the role of print in your, in your bundle and in your member experience? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, we started looking at print in the very beginning, and this is what got us thinking about the bundle really was, you know, people still really value print. It's a great experience. You know, when the magazine shows up in your mailbox, you know, you put it in your hands or it's a newspaper. And for me, like, I love reading the print newspaper when I got an airplane, you know, undistracted, it feels great. I love every you know, thing about it. And so we knew that people liked print. Um, we knew that, you know, pretty much the business model for us seemed like it didn't work. And that's basically selling print subscriptions on an individual basis. And so we wanted print to be a part of the bundle. Um, and so we started looking at various things and said like print really works when it's bundled with other things. Um, you can offset some of the costs there. And so we really believe in print. We'll always have print, um, but in order to make it work for us, it needs to be part of either what we call like a vertical pass, which you know we often sell like for Velo News or cycling publication, you can still get Velo News, the print publication, um, but you have to buy the brand pass and that gets you access to all the content um, for Velo News behind the paywall, all the digital content there, and you get the print magazine. Or you can subscribe to Outside Plus and get all of the benefits that we have and get actually two magazines and two books as part of that bundle. So we really believe in the print business. We just think it needs to be part of a bigger sort of um, bigger subscription or bundle. And how do you, um, for, for people who, let's say, intended to buy the print, the print, subscribe to the print edition, um, but are getting the full pass bundled in, how do you onboard them so that they, they learn about the other benefits and, and hopefully engage more fully in, in what they're paying for? Yeah, it's, it's a really, really great question because I've had a lot of experience building digital subscriptions and bundles and things like that. And you really have to communicate a lot with the end user at the end of the day or your purchaser, or however you want to describe it. Um, you know, when you're marketing to them, you need to explain carefully what this is. When you're sending it through the purchase flow, you need to be really um, careful and call out every single thing there. So we try to make it easy for them. You know, print is, you know, when you come in and you purchase and you're selecting all the benefits and how you're going to get them, we put print there. Um, but you're going through a flow of all the different benefits that are there. And it's very intentional of how we do that flow in the purchase process so people can see the benefits and you know, we know from the data that we have, you know, what users want and what the user benefits are at the end of the day. And so it's ordered and we pay, you know, close attention to even things like the color palettes that we're using and things like that to help it make it easier for the user to understand like where the benefits are and um, explain them. How, how do you use col color, color palettes? Um, just basically, you know, user testing, you know, to see, you know, things that are like, you know, what do users respond to more and things like that. So, 
we have a very bright and vibrant, um, I would say yellow oranges um, from outside that's there. And we've noticed that that's made a pretty interesting difference in terms of, you know, people paying attention to different things on the pages. Um, we can literally see it in the data um, based upon where the yellow is and isn't. Oh, I see. So, th so when they're looking at the screen, wherever the yellow is, that's where their eye goes. So you might focus most important yeah. message there. Yep. Okay. That makes, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's, interesting. it's really interesting. It's a little bit out of the Google page where they spend, I think like an inordinate amount of time, like selecting the blue or the purple for, for the links that are clicked. Huh. Fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, we're talking very narrowly about what, what you've done. I know you're, you're partnering as well. I mean, you guys have been so busy with, with um, you know, acquisitions and partnerships and really thinking broadly about how to deliver on your, on your promise to your members on, you know, helping them get the most out of, out of the outdoors and an active lifestyle. Um, what, what considerations should an organization keep in mind as they layer in more value for their members in terms of when to acquire, when to partner, when to build it yourself, um, and, and how to think about what should be in and what shouldn't be in the bundle? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. I think it comes down to, you know, really looking at like, okay, what do you need to serve your end users at the end of the day? And, and what's the best way to fulfill on that? Um, you know, for us, it's a lot of looking at, you know, the decision between acquiring um, or a partnership is around, synergies and around the level of control that we need to have and can we add value to something um you know to a business that we buy and so you know there's certain instances where we've done you know quite a bit of acquisition things where you know, we saw a great opportunity for us to have synergies and so active interest media um a big media publication and active living and healthy lifestyle business um you know, it made a lot of sense for us to work with them um, and acquire them because um, we could put their content onto our platform. We could, you know, consolidate sales teams. It really filled out our bundle and things like that. And we needed to have control over the business to do that. A partnership, you know, really just wouldn't make sense in that scenario. There's other scenarios where, um, like, we have a relationship with USA Triathlon right now. Um, and so USA Triathlon um, used to have a member benefit that was a magazine that was there. And so you know, they realized like, look, we're really not in the magazine business here. We're in the business of, you know, serving our users with events and other different benefits that are out there. And, you know, um, outside you have a magazine called Triathlete, should we pair up together? Um, and so we took a look at that and we realized, wow, there's, there's a lot of great synergies. We don't need two different triathlon magazines in the, in the ecosystem. Let's put them together, um, consolidate costs, have better content at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the end user wins, um, they get, you know, a better editorial publication. It's good for both our businesses. USA Triathlon is, you know, able to reduce costs and um, improve revenue. Um, we've been able to do the same thing on our side. So I think it's really, you know, just a matter of looking at each situation and a unique instance and just, you know, figuring out like, you know, what is it that you need for your users? And then what's the level of control that you want to have? We've been talking about kind of the, the, the broader, the broader picture. And I know you've, um, talked about the the bigger ecosystem for um, for the, the outside lifestyle. Um, I, I want to take I want to take us to the other side to the inward facing um, part of of your business. And you know when I when I've seen organizations that have moved um, to include new features um, and benefits for their members that have moved you know whether it's moving to digital, moving to um, a membership model. Uh, moving away from ads to subscription, uh, you know, all of those kinds of, of transitions um, that an organization makes, you know, to, to better serve their, their best members. Um, there are often challenges internally as well as, as, as externally. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, kind of what were the consumer facing challenges that you faced as you, you know, changed and expanded what you offered and, and moved your, your readers to digital? Um, what, what kind of response did you get from, from your consumers? And then I'm going to ask you, we can hold on it, but I am going to ask you, what was the response internally from your, from your team members and your colleagues? So let, let's yeah. start with consumer facing, <laughs> consumer facing uh, challenges and response. <laughs> now we're getting into really, really <laughs> tough stuff here. Um, I'll start with the consumer facing um, challenges. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously obvious, you know, there's going to be some users who are really upset when content's behind the paywall. Um, and you get messages from them, you know, like I've been reading Velo News for 20 years and, you know, I've never had to pay for content and this is really upsetting to me. 
and it's really like you take it personally and um we work really hard on this at our company i mean robin thurston our ceo responds to most of these things and it's a very personalized message and you know you start to build this bond with the person who sent you this message and you know for us it's just being very very honest um about the situation in media today um one we we always will have a free tier of content to view where you don't have to pay for content and that will always have significant viewership and that will always be ad supported but in today's digital ecosystem you also need to have a pay tier um we know that and we obviously clearly believe that um and so being clear with the customer and saying like, look, these are the economics of you know, how things are working today. And we want to continue to have these publications and we want to continue to serve with this great content that you've been reading for the last 20 years. But in order for us to do that today, this is what we feel like we need to do for our business model. And I found that conversation and being very honest and open with the person who sent you those messages is, is really helpful. And it not only helps that person out, but it also really helps us from the information that we gather from the person and understanding more about things that, you know, we might not have thought about and, you know, content that next time maybe we want a window in front of the paywall for a while for free and then move behind the paywall. Yeah. So, so before we, before we move on to internal, I have, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, one of them is, you know, on, on Tuesday of this week, I don't know if you had a chance to hear, but we had um, David Lorsch from Strava uh, talking about their their recent move to put some of their most popular features behind the paywall. And one of the things that he said is that he sort of recommended as a best practice was to be really clear about what should be free and what should be paid. Um, and and I'm curious how you think about that. You said, you know, you leave some things in front of the in front of the paywall. There's other things that go behind the paywall. How do you how do you th think about what what should what your these these diehard members should always get for free, and and what is content or experiences that are worth paying for? Yeah, I think it's a little more difficult for us because we're dealing with just content at the end of the day, and so we have to you try to make these objective like criteria you know, for what's going to go in front of the paywall, what's going to go behind it. But at the end of the day, it ends up being, you know, subjective. Um, you know, we really try to look at it as a stuff where we spend a lot of time um, on making something that's really unique, probably much more long form. And that's the type of stuff that we, you know, put behind the paywall. And we think it makes sense because it really differentiates our product. We've spent, you know, a lot of time and money just making it excellent and something that you can't find everywhere. And something that you know is going to be great for the end user at the end of the day. Um, and generally, the stuff, the type of content that is, you know, might be similar to other things in the marketplace, but it has our twist on it or our take on it or things like that. That type of content generally ends up in front of the paywall, but it ends up at the end of the day kind of being a case by case basis on you know where we think stuff should go. Sometimes we just think it's great for the public good, and it could be something we spend a ton of time on. And it's great content. And so a lot of our content, like around Tour de France, you know, we have a great package put together of the map and you know, podcasts and things like that. And a lot of that content is in front of the paywall just because we think it's great for our end users at the end of the day and we want them to have access to it. So we put it in front of the paywall. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I appreciate that you talked about, um, you know, one of the reasons for free being public good. Um, I know that in the past year with, with the, the global pandemic, there's been a lot of thinking and discussion around, you know, there's there's stuff that you make free because it fits into your business model, right? It's either mm -hmm. a free trial or it's a way of building habits or it creates the product for your advertisers. Um, there's an ROI on all of these, but there is another another reason, which is you know, public good, altruism, your role in the organ in the uh, in the community, um, and I think it is important both to be clear when you're doing it and to, to make sure that you understand we're doing this for the public good. We expect no return on this investment um, other than maybe just general goodwill uh, and, and to do it when it, when it's appropriate, like, like you said, with, with the tour de France, when yeah. it's something that you, that you stand for and that you, you want to share with the community. So I appreciate that, um, that example. Yeah. So, so, so let's, let's move on to the, to, <laughs> to the fun stuff how does the culture change and how do the roles change and how did your colleagues respond when you started making all of these big changes, um, moving, moving to digital, 
uh, adding all these different features and benefits and products, thinking more holistically about your, your overall ecosystem. Um, people that had been with these different publications for a long time, um, what had to change? Um, what stayed the same? And, and how, did people, how did people react? Yeah, this is a really great question and very interesting. I think to do this, you have to have the right culture and it needs to come from the top down. Um, you need to have a culture of understanding, you know, empathy, sympathy, and respect for everyone's roles and the values and the opinions that they have and that they bring to the table. And when you do that and you have a great, you know, community of sharing and listening and trying to learn from each other and trying to make things better, um, you know, you end up with a great product and things work pretty well at the end of the day. We took an approach of not that we, we need an entirely new team and we need to replace people. We took the approach of we need to supplement the teams that we have right now um, with different people. So, you know, you have all kinds of technical skills that you need and all kinds of sort of you know, subscription and user management people at the end of the day. But most of the time was also spent listening to the editorial teams and listening to what they thought and what they're hearing in the marketplace and how we could use that information, you know, to make the decision about like, what should we put in the bundle? What should we put um, in front of the paywall and what should we put behind the paywall? And, you know, for someone like me on the business side of things, you know, it was always, you know, trying to drive um, subscriptions for outside plus, you know, once in a while, you know, an editor will reach out to me and be like, I really feel passionately that this content should be in front of the paywall and, you know, users are going to react negatively to doing this and I don't think it's worth it. And, you know, I really take those, those messages to heart and I really appreciate it. And I really encourage the teams to bring those type of things to me so that, you know, we don't make a mistake and we continue to do the right thing um, in the ecosystem. Um, because at the end of the day, if we're not serving the overall ecosystem and the users very, very well, we know that we're not going to have a business. And so, you know, it takes a lot of listening internally, you know, to our own teams and listening to our users as well about like what we should do. But um, I would say like this, I've done this a few times with different businesses making these transitions. And this has probably been the greatest one I have just because the culture that, you know, Robin Thurston, our executive team said that, you know, like everybody brings something to the table, no matter how long you've been here, or what your level is, and we need to listen to each other. And, you know, we need to digest that information and figure out how we use it in the best possible way to make the overall business great. Yeah, it's 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 really it's 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 really difficult. I I mean I I give you know kudos to you um, for for having a culture where where people listen to each other and support each other, um, and and where there's a, a level of trust um, that that everybody is is striving toward the the same the same objective, although coming from from different vantage points. Um, I have two questions, and I'm trying to think of which should go first. It, can you can you share a little bit about the the metrics that you use at the different stages to know if your instincts are are correct? So, for example, um, what brings people on, what makes them engage, what makes them stay or leave, um, which which articles are driving you know subscription, which features are driving subscription? How do you and you don't have, obviously don't share yeah. anything that is that is confidential, but <laughs> can you give us a sense of of some of the metrics that you're that you're using yeah. on your dashboard and 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 also what you've asked um, your leadership team to expect from you? Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny, you know, so many people talk about the data, the data, the data today, right? Like there's so much data coming at you, and you know so much. you can easily easily have you know paralysis by analysis here. Um, Obviously, we look at the data. Um, the biggest thing for me is really, you know, engagement, you know, in terms of deciding like what should go in front of the paywall and what content we should make. So engagement is, you know, essentially how long is a person, you know, spending on the on the site? How long is the person spending reading each one of these articles? Um, obviously, there's other metrics just in terms of like total page views and, you know, users coming in and out, you know, how people are moving around up and down the funnel for us. Um, but I think it's important to realize like the data you know, can be a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you just look at the data all the time, you're going to get yourself essentially kind of caught in this hamster wheel, of, you know, making the same thing. And so I think it's important to look, I would say at least at external data. Um, and there's, you know, a lot of great stuff out there in terms of, you know, what's kind of working for other people, as well as just looking at, you know, general trends of, you know, what are other people doing? Um, not even just in the content space, not even like our own sort of, you know, sports side of things, fitness side of things, you know, what are different technologies that are coming out? What are different ways that people are presenting content and that type of stuff? And then 
you know, trying a little bit of like some new things all the time to add into the mix and see how that performs. And so, you know, it's not just completely for us about looking at the data. It's also about like just, you know, spending a lot of time looking at what's going on out there, like in this great system right now, it's like one of the greatest periods ever for creativity in, in my mind, because everybody can be a creator, everybody can be a distributor and everybody can, you know, essentially build their own mini content business themselves. And so there's so much great stuff to look at out there. And I spend a lot of time, you know, at night looking through this and just trying to make recommendations and also solicit that from our users, as well as people within um, our company of like different things that we should try. Yeah. I couple of, you know, you, you bring up a couple of, I think, super important points, um, one of which is, you know, thinking about, you know, what I would call like using your microscope, that is, you know, your data analysis, look at, you know, this is what we did this week, and this is what article got this many views, and so on. And, and balancing that with, you know, what I would think of as more your, your telescope view, where you're looking out at, say, you know, what are our peers doing? What are our competitors doing? What kind of new technology is possible? What are the changing needs and behaviors of the people that we want to engage um, and, and making sure that those two things are balanced. It's it's so easy. And we we've see this a lot in in businesses that have been around for a long time, particularly, you know, I think media, but also professional associations and gyms, you know, organizations that have had membership for a long time by by focusing only on what today's members are doing. Um, and they can often be very loud and demanding because they have a very intimate relationship with the, with the company. Um, you know, when you focus so much on them, sometimes you don't see the bigger, you know, bigger trends that are happening. Um, so I think that's a that's a really important point that I, I'm glad you you brought up, and I want to make sure that that people are are absorbing it. Um, you know, to not over overvalue day to day metrics, and to make sure you're balancing it with more long term um, strategy, and also you know, creative leaps forward. Um, as well as continuous tinkering. Uh, yeah. The other question, <laughs> did you want to say something else? Oh, no, no, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a great word, tinkering. You know, I, I get to spend a lot of time doing that and trying different things with partnerships and different technologies that we bring into the business. And it's, you know, it's probably my favorite part of the job is just trying new things. And, you know, it's so great because it's easier to try this in a digital world and it's easy to figure out if it's working or not working quickly. Yeah, continuous experimentation or continuous tinkering particularly, well, certainly in the digital world, it's it's much easier. And in the world of subscriptions, it's really important because you don't want to do something that's so different and jarring that it that it upsets your, your members and makes them look up and reconsider their purchase. But at the same time, you don't want when they look up and reconsider their purchase for them to say, these guys haven't changed anything in 20 years and there's so many better alternatives out in the rest of the world. Why haven't yeah. I been shopping? Um, yeah. So yeah, continuous tinkering is is really important. I think in the in the world of direct to consumer and in, in the world of subscriptions, um, and is much easier in, in the digital world. Um, so so sticking with this idea around you know your your internal um, systems and operations, uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the key roles in the organization? I know you know you're you're involved with with business business development. Um, mm -hmm. What are what are some of the key roles if, if you want to have, you know, a successful membership that goes beyond just the content um, and you're thinking about it, what kinds of, of skills and and what kinds of titles might be added um, to a more traditional organization as they they move into this, you know, kind of blending of of commerce, community and content? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll be clear, we kind of view everyone is like the same in our company in terms of their value in terms of like what they can bring to the table because you know it could be someone you know who's just started out the company who comes to us with a great idea so and we sort of value everyone in the same point in terms of how they can add value to the business i think what is really different especially in the digital side and the subscription side is you need a lot of people one with you know the traditional technical skills software development engineering you know a little bit sometimes of hardware product and things like that but you know, a unique skill set in terms of marketers who really understand the data and how to you know efficiently find the users. Um, you know, there's so much competition for the ad space. You know, to get these users and get them converted. So, you know, you can spend a ton of money on digital marketing. Um, so, people who know how to do that very effectively and cost effectively for your business is really important. Um, the people who can do the data analysis um, around what's happening with your subscription and understanding how various parts of the bundle add value. 
um, and tinkering, like you say, in terms of taking things in and out of the bundle and seeing how that um, affects the overall subscription. Um, and you can start to get a value for what are those individual units in your subscription actually worth and how much should you be paying for it? Because, you know, the partner sometimes like, um, you know, sometimes you don't own things that might be in the bundle. You might've bought a wholesale or things like that. Um, the person selling to you, selling those products to you has an idea of how much, you know, you should be paying for it. But oftentimes you can quickly see actually what the, the value is to your bundle. And, you know, by moving it out, sometimes you can get an idea of what you should actually be paying for it or even if you, sh you should actually have it in the bundle and things like that. And so people who have those unique skill sets really around marketing and doing the analysis of uh, what's happening with your bundle and how much you should be paying for it and what's happening with different cohorts. Um, when we ran this type of content, you know, did we get a lot of users in, which is great and a lot of purchasers, but did they stay? Um, you know, do we have to keep making content that got them in and things like that? And so it, I think that's probably the most unique skill set that I see that's probably different than you know, what's been in the marketplace before. Yeah. So, so, so engineering, uh, analytics, uh, digital marketing, mm -hmm. um, and an emphasis on engagement and retention as well as acquisition. Those are, those are yeah. definitely, um, key skills yeah. and key, um, lenses to look through, yeah. uh, I yeah. think, uh, are, are really important. Um, okay. So we're, we're getting to the end of our time. Um, before we wrap up, I want to, um, ask you, are you up for a little speed round? Okay, let's do it. I'm ready to <laughs> okay. go. Um, all right. First subscription you ever had? Uh, I think it was Beckett Baseball Card Monthly, the okay. baseball card publication that showed you how much they were worth. <laughs> um, favorite subscription? The present company excluded. Ah. Present com <laughs> all right. Well, I have three kids, so I would say favorite may not be my favorite thing to watch, but favorite thing that helps my life is probably Disney+. Plus. <laughs> um, the last time you enjoyed being outdoors? Uh, yesterday afternoon, I went on a mountain bike ride. Um, I competed in the 1998 Olympic Games, and one of my teammates is here, and we went on a mountain bike ride yesterday. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and a time, present company excluded, that you felt really connected to a brand you were buying from? Um, well... I'll say this, to, it's, it's a company that we have a close relationship, um, Strava. Um, <laughs> I, use Strava I use Strava every single day. Um, and it's a great way for me to connect with a subset of my friends who are very much interested in endurance sports. And we did not pay you to uh, give that little endorsement to <laughs> ah, yesterday's awesome speaker, David. Tuesday's awesome speaker, David. <laughs> <laughs> He's great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to open it up to questions now. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Um, first question, um, what are the, you know, two or three top lessons you've learned through this implementation of Outside Plus? Um, it's a continuous evolution in terms of, you know, what users value and what they want to have in the bundle. So, you know, you start out and we weren't, you know, we didn't think we knew everything and we would have it right from the very beginning. And so I think um, the biggest thing is, you know, continuing to basically listen to your users, sample them, look at the marketplace and iterate on the bundle. Great. Um, do you think straightforward subscription to content is a sufficient value proposition for a special interest media brand like magazines? Or do you think that today, it's really required that you have a wider membership offering in order to be successful. Yeah, this is a really this is a really interesting question. Something I think about all the time because I spend actually a lot of time helping out in a nonprofit space around Olympic sports, and I think they're very close to I'd say special interest things. And so for me, I came from um, a speed skating background, and um, you're not served well with media. And I always think like if someone was presenting something to me where it was a $10 a month digital subscription, literally just to tell me when the races happen and the results, I would pay $10 a month for that. And I think in that scenario, you know, your users are paying much, much more than they probably would pay for, you know, other digital subscriptions that are out there that have a much bigger audience that they're addressing. But um, from my lens, I do think the specialty individual subscriptions will work. I think, you know, it could be a little bit of a challenging in terms of the price point that you have to have for it because it's a smaller audience. So you, you probably have a much higher subscription fee than most people are willing to pay for, but I do see those working. 
Yeah, a really interesting thing that you that you brought out is that sometimes less content that is more specific <laughs> is worth more than lots of general interest articles. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's it's I I find that fascinating. Um, I think about like the information, you know, uh, the the newspaper here that that's focused on um, mostly on technology companies and provides things like. Um, org charts, you know, this is the Amazon org chart, right? <laughs> These are the people who re yeah. report directly, um, you know, and how people are paying twice as much or three times as much as they do for, let's say, a Wall Street Journal subscription, which has a much larger newsroom, covers a much broader base of things. And it's the same kind of, of journalist. It's just a, a more narrow and deep focus on the, you know, the one yep. thing that a particular group wants. Um, next question, um, please, can you give us some tangible examples of actual physical experiences you run? Um, like what might be an entry level event up to some of the more lengthy and engaging real world experiences you offer? And then it added, I suppose, a follow up from, have you seen a big pivot toward more digital event experiences over the last 18 months? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, and I had to educate myself a lot in this business on the in-person events. Um, I mentioned before, we own a series of what we call participatory cycling events called Roll Massive. Um, and the point of those is like, go out and have a great time. They're in iconic places in Colorado with amazing views. And it's all about cycling with your friends, great views, lots of fun, great food as well. Um, so we have those events that are there. We also own the Warren Miller Library, which Warren Miller was a documentarian in the ski business. You've probably seen a lot of his, his movies. He's, the business has been around, I think, for almost 50 years. It's amazing. But there's a tour that goes along with that every year. So when the new film comes out, um, they do theatrical releases that literally tours around the US. And so we have events related to that. Um, we also started a fly fishing film tour, which has done really, really well, um, similar to Warren Miller. It's more of an amalgamation of different, I would say, pro-am creators out there. And we put it together in one film, and then that tours around. And, um, we also own... Um, a fitness industry professional business to business conference called idea that's out there. And so um, those have done really, really well for us. They're really great in the bundle because again, people want, you know, in the bundle, different, um, different things for different points when they're basically essentially consuming content and events are part of content for us. Um, we've done more digital events this past year. Um, they've done really well because, you know, people really miss the opportunity to connect with their peers and, um, you know, whether it's on the business to business side of things or, you know, just the, the people that they used to bike with, you know, once a year. And so those have done well for us as well. Um, okay. Uh, did you need to integrate with a different platform to meet the needs of your membership or did your, the platform or the, the tech stack you're using already have all the capabilities you need? Um, we needed to use, you know, we put together a lot of technologies um, to make the platform that we have. We build some of those technologies ourselves and sometimes we build on top of other platforms that are out there. Um, we use WordPress as our core content management system. Um, and then we build the front end, the websites and the apps ourselves, but we iterate off of the WordPress platform. So we take their course at a technology, we use different plugins, we make some of that stuff our own. So, um, and some things like we make completely ourselves, like our personalization engine and system, we do that completely on ourselves. So, you know, it's a combination of getting services from other places. It's a combination of making them ourselves. Got it. Okay. And then I have to say this from Jamie Gavin, um, and I'm going to do this verbatim. Wait, hold on. You competed in the Olympic Games. Tell <laughs> us more about this, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well... Yeah, I, I always say like in my previous life, or as, as my wife would say, you know, when he weighed 40 pounds less, but um, I was a short track speed skater. I wasn't very good, but I had the opportunity to compete in the 99 Olympic Games um, for the US Olympic team in the sport of short track speed skating. Um, it was, you know, an amazing experience because I wasn't really expected to make the team. I ended up making the team and, you know, it forever changed my life. You know, it set me on a path that has really helped accelerate my professional career and you know, um, I probably wouldn't have been able to break into sports and media without that. And so, um, you know, I'm forever grateful for that experience. Wow. That, <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't know that either. So um, I'm so <laughs> glad you shared that. And by the way, saying you weren't very good and you were in the Olympics, it's like, yeah. 
you know, you can't you can't be not very good and also be in the Olympics. Um, but I appreciate your modesty. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tommy. This was fantastic. Um, really learned a tremendous amount. Um, and thanks to everybody who's listening. Signing off. Sure. See you soon. Thank you so much, Robbie, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. Thank you.